Recording in progress. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our September Grand Rounds. I hope everybody got to enjoy the uh, Labor Day weekend. A couple of um, quick announcements uh, before we start. For the faculty, uh, please, um, for those of you who haven't done it, remember to get your compliance modules done, your UWP compliance modules. Um, we've um, convinced them to push the deadline back to September 15th, at which point um, you will lose um, your privileges. I think we've had many months to do this, and they're trying to get us back on a regular schedule. So um, unfortunately, when we get these done, I believe there's going to be another set coming very much the same with a similar, um, with a shorter deadline. You can do all of those modules in about 15 uh, minutes. So please get those done. The other announcement for everybody is that um, you should have received an email from Tim Dellett that our um, next um, rounds of Moderna or Pfizer COVID vaccine that targets the original coronavirus as well as the two newer variants um, is available within UW Medicine at all of the usual sites. Um, it is mandatory in the sense that the flu vaccine is mandatory. Um, I do believe uh, if you go against um, most everybody's advice and decide not to get that vaccine, you will be able to um, go online and fill out a, a declination. Um, that's going to be coming out in the next um, week or so. Uh, but you are able to go online and schedule and get the vaccine, I believe, as soon as um, tomorrow. Um, a couple of uh, kudos before we um, start Grand Rounds. Just um, give me a moment here. We have quite a few, so I'll I'll be um, brief. Um, there is one that was passed along to me from Billy Crutcher, and it was regarding one of our interns, um, Sarah Batajer. Batajaje, um, and it was from one of the trauma ARNPs at Harborview. And um, they said that um, Sara um, was accidentally or incorrectly paged um, to take care of something that should have gone to one of the other teams. But instead of redirecting the message, um, Sara did the right thing and um, dropped what she was doing to evaluate the patient on her own and then communicate back to the medicine team and the red team. Um, so thank you for that, Sarah. Um, then um, there is um, one from uh, Bailey Ingalls, and it was um, regarding um, the help she received um, from um, Freddie, who let me just see this here. He um, reached out regularly to, to Bailey and the other interns to check in and see how they were doing. He would follow up um, after his shift to check uh, their reductions and talk about their reduction splinting and pin placement and how they could be done better. And Bailey said she would not have been nearly as comfortable in the ED um, had Freddie um, not taking the extra time um, to help during what was a busy um, summer um, trauma rotation. So thank you to Freddie um, Yang for that. And uh, thank you to Bailey for passing that along. And then there was a note from the children's ER about Zach Mills. And um, I can summarize by just saying over the course um, of a couple of shifts. One of the pediatric emergency fellows named Casey Coyd um, was just very complimentary about how professional and hardworking and compassionate uh, Zach was, and they um, look forward to um, working with him again in the future. So uh, thank you for that, Zach. Um, 
we'll save. There's a few more, but in the interest of time, I'm going to actually save them for our next grand rounds. And we'll move on to today's grand rounds, um, which is um, titled Skiffy Epiphanies. And it is um, regarding uh, complications and management of slip capital, capital femoral epiphyses. And we're fortunate that Dr. Ina Nielsen, one of our R4 residents, um, and Dr. Uh, Todd Blumberg, one of our assistant professors at Children's, who has acquired um, quite a bit of um, um, specialized ex expertise in care of the uh, pediatric and young adult hip, have partnered uh, to put together this grand rounds for us. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chansky. And give me just a moment to share my screen. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Dr. Blumberg, for doing this presentation with me. Today, we'll be talking about Skiffy epiphanies, complications, and updates on management. I have no disclosures. I will begin with a brief overview of Skiffy and then move on to some cases that represent relevant points of the disorder and finally move on to talking about updates and some of the more recent controversies in treatment of this disorder. So the population most commonly affected by Skiffy is obese adolescent males. Incidence peaks around 12 years of age, skewing younger than females, and has declined steadily in recent decades as the age of pubertal onset has de decreased. Multiple risk factors for Skiffy have been identified, including endocrine disorders, especially hypothyroidism and growth hormone deficiency, renal disorders, vitamin deficiencies, and trisomy 21. However, the number one risk factor by far is obesity. 80% of patients with Skiffy are obese, and as this study out of Scotland shows, the incidence of Skiffy has increased steadily in correlation with increasing childhood obesity. However, this may not be the complete story, as a more recent study demonstrated strong correlation of Skiffy with leptin levels, regardless of obesity status. Leptin is a risk factor for obesity and has been shown to weaken the structure of the physis. And as with many conditions in pediatrics, the physis is really key in Skiffy. The disruption of the physis occurs through the hypertrophic zone, where the transition from cartilage to calcified bone creates a weak point, similar to a physeal fracture. In Skiffy patients, this pre-existing structural weakness is maximally stressed. So at the top of the screen here, you can see a diagram of the developing ossification center throughout childhood, but our focus is on the transition from childhood to adolescence, just before the physis close. As children enter this stage, several key anatomic changes occur in the thermal head neck junction. The thermal neck lengthens and the thermal neck shaft angle decreases. This leads to a more vertical physis and subsequently greater shear forces across the physis. If you remember this diagram of forces across the hip, it becomes clear that any increased body weight in adolescence massively increases the shear forces. At the same time, the perichondral ring around that physis begins to attenuate as it nears closure, eliminating some of the inherent structural support. And as if that wasn't enough, microscopic studies have shown that the physis in Skiffy is characterized by disorganized chondrocytes, proliferation of extracellular matrix throughout all the zones, and generalized disruption in chondrocyte differentiation and ossification. Many of the risk factors we just discussed also alter the cellular structure of the physis, further weakening it and increasing the propensity to slip. Once a hip has slipped, it can be classified in several ways for the purposes of both research and treatment. One of the older systems divides patients by their slip acuity. Onset of the slip is defined as the onset of hip pain. Less than three weeks is acute, more than three weeks is chronic, and those patients who have had an acute worsening of long-standing hip pain may have acute on chronic skiffy. This is a classification system more useful for research purposes as acuity is not well correlated with rates of AVN or patient outcomes. More useful is slip severity, which is a radiographic classification, so we can briefly discuss the imaging of skiffy. When a child presents with concern for the disorder, two radiographs should be obtained, an AP pelvis and a bilateral frog lateral. On the AP, you can check for Klein's line, physeal widening, and epiphyseal shortening. In a normal AP hip radiograph, a line drawn along the superior femoral neck will intersect the femoral head, which is called Klein's line. But in Skiffy, the medial displacement, or really the lateral displacement of the femoral neck, results in the line failing to intersect the head. Physeal widening and epiphyseal shortening are a little bit more subtle, but if you zoom in, you, as you can see here, the epiphysis looks much smaller than on the contralateral side. Often, the frog lateral is where Skiffy is most easily seen, as this uh, better demonstrates the displacement of the uh, femoral neck in relation to the head. And this is the view on which we measure Southwick's angle, which is how we define slip severity. 
<clears throat> this is an angle formed by a line drawn down the femoral neck and a line drawn perpendicular to the femoral epiphysis, measuring the posterior angulation of the head with respect to the neck. This patient has a Southwick angle of 60 degrees. The difference in Southwick angle, mild being zero to 30 degrees, moderate 30 to 50 degrees, and severe greater than 50 degrees difference. Slip severity has an inverse relationship with outcomes. Several studies have noted a correlation between the degree of slip and the amount of labral and cartilaginous injury seen intraoperatively, and the degree of residual slip is predictive of later femoroacetabular impingement and osteoarthritis. And finally, we can talk about stability, which requires some clarification because stability is defined in two different ways in the literature. For research purposes, the definition from Loader's original paper on risk factors for avascular necrosis is used. Patients with stable slips can ambulate. Those with unstable slips cannot. In that paper, Loader evaluated 55 acute slips, 25 being stable and 30 unstable. In the stable group, none developed AVN and 96% had a satisfactory outcome at three years. In the unstable group, AVN developed in 14 of 30 patients and only 47% of those patients had satisfactory outcomes at three years. The other form of stability is defined intraoperatively and helps guide surgical decision-making. In this case, a slip is stable if the metaphysis and epiphysis move as a single unit when the hip is branched under fluoroscopy. A slip is unstable if the metaphysis moves independently from the epiphysis, as you can see in this video here. In that latter case, a reduction is more feasible and a more aggressive treatment approach is typically used, which we'll discuss later. So now that we have a background established to discuss Skiffy, we can move on to some of the cases that demonstrate relevant points. This first case is a so-called basic case of Skiffy. This is an 11-year-old female who was evaluated by our primary care physician for two to three months of right hip pain. She had no history of trauma, but was ambulating with a limp. And on examination in her pediatrician's office, she had this uh, physical exam finding, which is obligate external rotation with hip flexion on the right side. This is a finding seen in all patients with Skippy. And you can see here, we try and flex her up without externally rotating and she won't go. And then you externally rotate and they can flex up. So x-rays were obtained demonstrating this right-sided slip. Her Southwick angle was 26 degrees. All of her labs were normal, but she had a BMI of 25. So in this patient, we need to treat a stable, mild, chronic skiffy. The patient has a pretty typical presentation for this disorder. She's obese, no other risk factors, and is nearing skeletal maturity. So what's the best treatment strategy for her? Surgical management for Skiffy can be divided into stable and unstable categories. And for stable slips, it's sometimes helpful to further subdivide management by slip severity. Mild or moderate slips are typically treated with pinning in situ with a single large screw, and moderate slips may benefit from deformity correction in a delayed fashion. For more severe slips, surgical hip dislocation with reduction and internal fixation can be an option versus in situ fixation and later deformity correction if needed. A meta-analysis of the treatment of stable slips demonstrated a higher risk of AVN with an open approach, but overall higher patient satisfaction scores. The management of unstable slips is more controversial due to the variety of variables thought to contribute to the high rate of AVN. And as a reminder, when we talk about instability in this context, we're talking about epiphyseal instability rather than their weight-bearing status. In a review of the literature, several risk factors for the development of AVN in these slips were identified. Those that can be controlled to some degree are shown here reduction, capsulotomy, timing of fixation, pinning, and open versus closed management. In general, the recommendation is for treatment within 24 hours of presentation, fixation with two screws, and capsular decompression, whether percutaneous or open. The data on the role of reduction is very mixed, with some noting increased rates of AVN and others decreased rates. In a poll of pediatric orthopedic surgeons regarding treatment of unstable skiffy, 35% of surgeons would perform in situ pinning with a joint decompression, 35% will go directly to an open procedure, and 30% would attempt a closed reduction and proceed with insight to pinning versus converting to open if an inadequate reduction was obtained. This is a treatment algorithm for unstable SCIFI based on intraoperative perfusion monitoring designed to limit the rate of AVN. So if a patient presents with a severe unstable SCIFI, move directly to a more open procedure, such as a modified done or a partial technique assisted reduction, if the surgeon is truly uncomfortable with these techniques, you can do an in situ fixation and perhaps have your partner who's more comfortable with the other procedures do them in the morning. But with a mild skiffy, you want to check perfusion, and we can discuss how this can be done later. But if there's no perfusion, you move on towards a percutaneous capsulotomy and then an open arthrotomy with a variety of procedures after there if there is still no perfusion. So our patient with her stable, chronic, mild slip underwent in situ pinning of the right side with a seven millimeter cannulated screw and she did great on subsequent follow-up. 
At six weeks, she was pain-free and started on progressive weight bearing. At three months, she came back to clinic with no signs of AVN on her x-rays, still pain-free, but also still not ambulating because she actually never went to PT. Uh, so once we finally got her into some therapy, she came back at six months, walking normally, pain-free. And at three years, she was back to playing volleyball in high school. But that doesn't mean she's healed perfectly. So if you look at her x-rays, on the right side, you can see some evidence of acetabular sclerosis, joint space narrowing, and a cam deformity. So all signs of early arthritis and likely hip pain later down the road. So that patient had a relatively straightforward presentation and treatment. She was our basic case. But the treatment of Skiffy can quickly become more complex, and forming controversies regarding treatment come up repeatedly in the literature. These are one, who should get prophylactic fixation of the contralateral side? Two, how do we manage the very young child with Skiffy? Three, what is the best way to treat an unstable slip? And four, what do we do after the slip is healed but significant deformity remains? So our next case represents a good opportunity to talk about indications for prophylaxis. This is a 10 year old male presenting with several months of limp, six weeks of left groin pain after a fall that had been worse in the past week after being tackled in football practice. He was able to bear weight, but his pediatrician was concerned and so obtained these x-rays noting a mild left-sided slip with a Southwick angle of 15. So he was referred to orthopedics. This patient had a chronic stable mild slip. His BMI was in the 99th percentile, but he was relatively young for a skiffy at age 10 and he was relatively active as a football player. So what do we need to consider when talking about fixing his contralateral side? Around 25% of children presenting with a unilateral slip will go on to develop a contralateral slip, placing them at high risk for AVN, osteoarthritis, and poor function later in life. Multiple studies have attempted to identify risk factors for contralateral slip to help decide who would benefit from prophylactic fixation, as it's certainly not a benign procedure. This study demonstrated a small but significant rate of complications associated with prophylactic fixation, including peri-implant fracture and avascular necrosis. Aside from the risk factors we've already discussed, like hypothyroidism, renal disease, and obesity, age is a huge predictor of contralateral slip. The younger a patient at presentation, the higher their risk of slip. However, bone age is a much more reliable predictor than chronologic age. The modified Oxford bone age score essentially grades skeletal maturity using an AP pelvis radiograph and multiple landmarks. In this study shown, a score of 16 to 18 out of 26 on the modified scale had a positive predictive value of 96% and a negative predictive value of 92% for development of a contralateral slip. So the authors advocated prophylactic pinning of any patient presenting with a score of 16 to 18. The posterior slope angle is another radiographic measure that can be used to predict contralateral skiffy. This is the angle formed between a line perpendicular to the axis of the femur and a line along the physis. In this study, patients who developed a contralateral slip had a significantly higher PSA compared to those who did not. And the authors found that if a PSA of 14 were used as a cutoff for prophylactic fixation, the number needed to treat to prevent a contralateral slip is 1.8. So for our patient, he was relatively young, had a BMI over the 99th percentile with a modified Oxford score of 17. So he was indicated for prophylactic fixation and ultimately underwent inside to fixation of his left-sided slip and prophylactic fixation on the right side. <clears throat> and the goal of putting in these screws is to get the physis to fuse and prevent further slippage. It's typically recommended that at least four screw threads go beyond the physis to prevent growing off the screw while this occurs. But this patient's physis really just did not want to cooperate. At six weeks, he came back doing well and allowed to start weight bearing. One year later, he comes back, his physis are still not fused, but he remains asymptomatic, walking and doing all of his activities. Comes back a year after that, still not fused, um, but remaining asymptomatic, but you can see that his screws are barely across his physis at this point. So really not doing a whole lot to one, help the physis fuse and two, prevent him from slipping. Three months after that, he came back, physis still not fused, maybe a little bit closer on that right side, but he was starting to have left-sided hip pain. And if you look closely at his frog lateral, you can see some irregularity along the physis and some anterior widening, all indications that he has an impending reslip. So he was taken back to the operating room for exchange pinning. Um, and then one year after that had finally fused and he was back to playing football. So that patient was relatively young for Skiffy and obviously required prophylaxis, but what do you do with an even younger patient? Our next case is a seven-year-old female who came to the emergency department with two weeks of progressively worsening left hip pain, unresponsive to over-the-counter medications, and now ambulating with a limp. Her exam in the ED was notable for decreased abduction of the left hip compared to the right, and pain with internal and external rotation of both hips. These x-rays were obtained demonstrating a left-sided skiffy, and 
we got our usual lab workup in the emergency department of a TSH, vitamin D, and HbA1c. And for this patient, she had a very significantly elevated TSH and low T4. The upper limit of normal for TSH is 4.5, and hers was 318. She had actually been seen in endocrinology clinic the week before and diagnosed with severe hypothyroidism and started on levothyroxine. So for this patient, she had an acute, stable, mild slip. She is an atypical presentation for Skippy. She's very young, very active with a normal BMI, but in terms of prophylactic fixation and her risk factors, she had severe hypothyroidism and a modified Oxford score of 16. So she was definitely indicated for prophylaxis. She underwent in situ pinning of the left side and prophylactic fixation on the right side with sliding Skippy screws. This screw works by having a female and male component that's read into the epiphysis and lateral femoral cortex respectively with an intercalary smooth component that can slide. In theory, the smooth bore through the physis prevents physeal closure, allowing for continued growth and remodeling, while the threaded fixation stabilizes the epiphysis and prevents further slip. Biomechanical studies have shown that this screw system is equivalent to the standard fully threaded screw used in Skippy. And this study out of Canada demonstrated that use of a telescoping screw did indeed allow for continued remodeling of the proximal femur after fixation. While this was slightly superior in the side affected by Skiffy, mostly in terms of the alpha angle, the most impressive difference was in the sides fixed prophylactically. Those patients who were prophylactically fixed with a sliding screw had proximal femoral growth and morphology nearly identical to unfixed controls. And for a very young patient with lots of growth remaining, such as the seven-year-old we've been talking about, this is a great option to prevent complications such as this greater trochanteric overgrowth from prophylactic fixation with subsequent extra articular impingement. And these screws have a wide variety of uses. They can also be used for very young femoral neck fractures for the same reason, allowing continued physeal growth while stabilizing the femoral neck. And our patient, uh, these screws worked exactly as intended. She did wonderfully. At two month follow-up, she was ambulating without a limp, pain-free, and her labs were starting to normalize in terms of her hypothyroidism. At one year, she had gone back to cheerleading, had no hip pain, and her thyroid labs had completely normalized. And at two years, she can see she had completely grown off her screw on the right side and almost grown off her screw on that left side. And because her labs had normalized and she had no further risk factors for Skippy, her screws were removed and not replaced. And as you can see from the progression of her x-rays, one year on the left and two years on the right, the open physis allowed by that sliding screw actually allowed her metathesis to remodel slightly limiting her post skiffy deformity and decreasing her risk of greater trochanteric overgrowth. But not all patients do as well as our previous uh, cases. My final case I'll talk about is one of uh, the dreaded skiffy complication, avascular necrosis. This is a 10-year-old female with no past medical history and no history of trauma presenting as a transfer from an outside hospital for a left-sided skiffy. She began having left hip pain a week prior to presentation and was seen by her pediatrician, but x-rays at that time were normal. One day prior to her presentation, she felt a pop in her left hip while getting into a car and was no longer able to ambulate. So her parents took her to an outside facility where a CT scan demonstrated a severe left-sided skippy and she was transferred for further care. On examination in the ED, she was holding her leg in external rotation, did not tolerate any of the motion of the hip or knee due to severe pain. Her labs were normal, but her BMI was in the 96th percentile. So this patient's problem was an unstable, acute, severe slip she was a relatively typical presentation for Skiffy, a high BMI, no endocrine disorders, uh, not super active. Particular to this patient was an unstable social situation, which comes into play for some of her treatment later on. Um, and in terms of her contralateral side, she had a modified Oxford score of 18. So she went incidental reduction of that left side while positioning on the fracture table with in situ fixation and percutaneous capsular decompression. Her right side was prophylactically fixed. And as a reminder from the earlier slide, patients at highest risk of AVN are those with severe unstable slips such as this patient. The modifiable risk factors for development of AVN include reduction, capsulotomy, timing, number of screws, and possible conversion to an open procedure. And our patient had an incidental reduction, a percutaneous capsulotomy, and underwent fixation within 24 hours of presentation at our institution. Unfortunately, she was lost to follow-up at her six-week visit due to some social issues. And her first follow-up was approximately three months later after she had fallen. Patient reported she'd been doing well until a week prior to this follow-up when she fell and had subsequent pain in the left hip. Her exam in clinic at that time was significant for pain on movement of the hip and her x-ray showed flattening of the epiphysis consistent with early avion and screw protrusion with possible reslip of her capital epiphysis. 
So she went to the operating room for revision fixation, which was removal of that left-sided screw and inside to replacement with a new six and a half millimeter screw. They did get four threads beyond the face physis as recommended, but otherwise tried to keep that screw short in anticipation of further femoral head collapse. Three weeks post-op, she was seen in an outside facility for x-ray and had been touched on weight bearing with reportedly her pain improving. Unfortunately, at her six week visit, she had had another fall. Um, she lost her balance in the kitchen on her crutches, landed on that left hip and had subsequent severe pain with inability to bear weight. And her x-rays demonstrated reslip of her epiphysis with screw protrusion from the femoral head and advanced collapse of the femoral head. So she was taken back for a second revision surgery <clears throat> with placement of two screws, a shorter superior screw and a second screw inferior and posterior. Fortunately, six weeks after this revision, she came back with persistent left-sided hip pain, really unable to mobilize. She was using a wheelchair for any sort of distance and crutches inside of her house. And her x-ray showed left femoral head with severe collapse and development of a saddle deformity. And the superior screw had cut out into the acetabulum. So she was finally just taken for bilateral removal of hardware. And as you can see from her intraoperative fluoroscopy, she has a severe femoral head deformity and acetabular deformity. And unfortunately she hasn't followed up since this procedure. Patients with Skiffy are at particularly heightened risk of avascular necrosis due to the vascular anatomy of the femoral head and neck during childhood. As we discussed earlier, it always comes down to that physis. Between the ages of three and physeal closure, the physis blocks blood flow between the femoral neck and the epiphysis. During those in-between years, the epiphysis receives dominant blood supply from the posterior superior branch of the lateral ascending circumflex artery and the posterior inferior branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery and retinacular vessels. In Skiffy, this already relatively limited blood supply is disrupted. Three main causes of disruption are proposed in the literature. The initial injury mechanism, later on when intracapsular hematoma increases pressure and causes a compartment syndrome-like effect, and during surgical fixation. This angiographic study used preoperative superselective angio to evaluate blood flow to the thermal head for unstable Skiffy's. Six of nine patients demonstrated no flow through the medium circumflex artery preoperatively, and four out of six had restoration of flow after reduction using a modified DEN procedure. One of those who had no re restoration of flow actually had complete tear of the retinacular vessels when they opened uh, him up for the procedure. So this and similar angiographic studies suggest that the initial injury mechanism causes kinking or tearing of the vessels leading to AVN. But this study by Schrader et al. performed intraoperative ICP monitoring of thermal head blood supply for unstable skiffies. Six hips had no measurable flow, all of these got percutaneous capsular decompressions after which blood flow was restored, and none of these patients went on to develop AVN, suggesting the hematoma can also play a large role in the complication. And in this animation from a talk by Dr. Scheneker at Vanderbilt, you can see how the closed reduction of an epiphyseal unstable or severe slip can lead to kinking or tearing of the retinacular vessels if the flexion moment of Skiffy isn't taken into account, leading to subsequent AVN. Efforts to better define the causes of AVN are motivated by a desire to more effectively address them during surgical treatment, decreasing the overall complication rate. This paper by Loader demonstrated highly variable rates of AVN across multiple papers, all of which attempted to address AVN by different techniques. He ultimately concluded that AVN will never be a never event in unstable SCIFI as there are too many variables at play, but the rate can be significantly decreased um, with careful surgical uh, procedure. And as this case demonstrates, AVN is certainly a devastating complication of Skiffy, but even if a patient doesn't develop necrosis, they haven't necessarily healed the Skiffy without complications. The very nature of treatment for Skiffy introduces deformity through physeal arrest, coxa breva, greater trochanteric overgrowth, and altered abductor biomechanics. In a comparison of patients undergoing surgical treatment for hip pain due to primary impingement versus post-Skiffy deformity, the Skiffy patients were young, had more severe deformity, and a higher prevalence of thermal head lesions and diffuse cartilage injury. In the long term, osteoarthritis secondary to AVN impingement or simply the chondral damage from the slip itself is a significant long term complication not often seen by the person who treated the Skippy in the first place. Although the exact rate of total hip arthroplasty after Skippy is unclear, current long term data shows a 24% rate at around 20 years and predicted to be closer to 50% at 50 years. And beyond the orthopedic perspective, Skippy has long term impact on the overall quality of life of these patients. A 20-year follow-up study demonstrated a much higher rate of comorbid illness compared to the general population. They have a 10% versus 1.5% mortality rate for their age group, a five times higher rate of diabetes, three times higher rate of hypertension, and two and a half times higher rate of obesity. Some call Skiffy the canary in the coal mine for a subsequent metabolic disorder or general decline in health. While these kids present to the clinic or the ED um, to orthopedics, it's a good opportunity to get them established with a multidisciplinary team to address some of these other health risks. 
So in summary, Scythia primarily affects obese adolescents. For stable hips, you can do in situ pinning. For unstable hips, they need a more urgent surgical procedure and can undergo in situ pinning versus open reduction. Consider prophylactic fixation in very young or high risk patients. And remember, unstable Scythia has a high rate of AVN, but other deformities do exist besides AVN. So these patients need close follow up. And now we'll hear from Dr. Blumberg. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent and thorough introduction to the topic, Dr. Nielsen. Good morning, everyone. Objectives for the second half of Grand Rounds are to discuss the management of the unstable skiffy and treatment of the post skiffy deformity. I have no relevant disclosures to our topic this morning. At the beginning of the talk, Dr. Nielsen introduced four controversies in the management of slipped capital femoral epiphysis. After excellent discussion of the first two, I'll attempt to clarify treatment of the unstable skiffy and discuss the current concepts around management of the residual deformity after skiffy. I'll discuss four more cases, including modern, modern surgical approaches to an unstable slip. I'll discuss one method for managing early collapse from avascular necrosis after an unstable skiffy. And finally, I'll review the principles of deformity correction in a late presenting skiffy. The first case I'll present is an 11 year old female who had left hip pain for a week, but was still able to participate in activities. Unfortunately, while running, she sustained immediate pain and was unable to bear weight any longer. Radiographs of the pelvis show a left slip capital femoral epiphysis with severe slip angle and no signs of substantial callus correlating with her acute onset of symptoms. I will use the same approaches for the earlier cases that were discussed. The patient presented with an unstable slip based on the loader definition and was unable to bear weight. Presentation is considered acute with less than three weeks of antecedent hip pain. Patient factors are notable for a non-stereotypical skiffy. They presented with a normal BMI and she is actively engaged in high level competitive sports. Contralateral considerations are notable for a low modified Oxford score of 17, a high posterior sloping angle uh, on the contralateral hip, uh, suggesting increased risk for a contralateral slip down the road. Endocrine evaluation was normal. The Southwick slip, Southwick slip angle was 60 degrees consistent with a severe slip on the left side. I always like to point out that the epiphysis has indeed not moved. Uh, rather, the femoral neck metaphysis has externally rotated, in this case, approximately 60 degrees. And as a result, the femoral neck metaphysis has translated anteriorly relative to the epiphysis, which is static. Posterior sloping angle, as mentioned previously, was 17 degrees, considered elevated and at higher risk for developing a contralateral slip. There are four treatment options for a patient with an unstable acute slip. Options include stabilizing in situ with possible delayed osteotomy to treat any residual deformity. A closed reduction could be performed followed by screw stabilization. And finally, an open reduction could be performed utilizing either a controlled reduction or anatomic realignment with a modified done osteotomy procedure. In this case, several stars aligned. We elected to perform a modified done procedure with anatomic realignment. A complex interplay of surgeon availability, OR access, patient factors, and severity of the slip influenced the decision to perform the modified done procedure, a variation on a subcapital femoral neck osteotomy that can be used to treat severe, unstable slip capital femoral epiphysis. The procedure is akin to five hip operations in one. It combines a surgical hip dislocation with the development of an extended retinacular soft tissue flap containing the terminal branches of the medial femoral circumflex artery followed by a subcapital osteotomy in which callus is resected to take the tension off the vascular pedicle to the femoral epiphysis. Proximal femoral physis is removed next, and finally the epiphysis is reduced and internal fixation placed. The procedure allows restoration of anatomy with visualization of the femoral head blood supply, and at least in theory, a tension-free closure uh, so that the terminal branches of the medial femoral circumflex can be preserved as they enter the femoral head. The group that initially developed the procedure notes that in situ pinning of severe unstable slips or reduction of an acute on chronic uh, case may lead to kinking or stretching of the lateral epiphyseal vessels and higher risk of AVN. As Dr. Nielsen alluded to, there is angiographic data to support that reduction of an unstable slip can indeed restore blood flow, so long as the retinacul uh, retinaculum is intact. As you can imagine, there is a very steep learning curve for this procedure. To reduce the risk of AVN during anatomic realignment, there are three critical steps. The first is the slow, methodical development of an extended retinacular flap. The soft tissue flap contains the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter periosteum with the external rotators and includes the terminal branches of the medial femoral circumflex artery that enter the femoral epiphysis. 
In order to reduce the risk of AVN, tension on this flap must be relieved by resection of any callus that has developed on the femoral neck. Curiously, even in acute slips, some callus is often present, suggesting a component of chronic physial instability. Additionally, removal of the remainder of the growth plate provides an additional degree of subtle shortening and further reduces tension on the soft tissue flap. This step, at least in theory, also accelerates bony healing and perhaps helps aid in revascularization of the epiphysis by uh, the contribution of some metaphyseal blood flow. This drawing shows the development of the extended retinacular flap containing the blood vessels to the femoral head. The flap is started distally uh, and developed from the lesser trochanter to its insertion at the head neck junction. Some refer to this portion of the procedure as akin to peeling a banana as the femoral neck is exposed completely subperiostally. The retinacular flap enables safe mobilization of the epiphysis so it can then be fixed with threaded pins or screws. Typically, a rongeur is used to remove callus, being careful not to iatrogenically shorten the femoral neck too much. Once the callus is removed from the femoral neck, any remaining physial cartilage is excised. And then the femoral head is provisionally reduced onto the neck and wires are used to hold um, the femoral head provisionally. Typically, two 6.5 millimeter fully threaded cannulated screws are then placed to stabilize the epiphysis. Final fluoroscopic images show anatomic reduction uh, and slight advancement distally of the greater trochanter. This advancement is done due to the anticipated growth of the trochanter as the proximal femoral physis has been removed and further growth would not be anticipated. At three months postoperatively, the left hip shows fused physis and nearly healed trochanteric osteotomy. At six months postoperatively, the proximal femoral physis has completely healed without any signs of avascular necrosis. The patient has symmetric hip range of motion and is released to full activities. Early results of the procedure from the Swiss group and early adopters of this technique in North America showed excellent results, at least initially. No patients in the initial cohort developed AVN and there were uniformly impressive patient reported outcome scores. The next generation of surgeons to perform this procedure, however, did not find similar reproducibility, suggesting there is a steep learning curve. In a multi-center study, five surgeons pooled their early cases with this procedure and identified an AVN rate of 26%, which is quite similar to prior published meta-analyses on AVN in unstable SCIFI, regardless of treatment. Currently in North America, only a few centers have significant exposure with this modified done technique. While these results may have been disappointing to early adopters and those who are looking for an alternative to in situ stabilization, it certainly has led to fewer surgeons adopting this technique more recently as the standard approach for managing unstable slips. Perhaps the most devastating acute complication of this procedure is not related to AVN, but rather iatrogenic instability. Uh, in one multicenter study, 17 of 406 patients developed this complication, occurring between one day and two months post-operatively, with the average time to this uh, detection of this instability at three weeks. Many of these patients required further corrective surgery and for some prolonged periods of spica casting to achieve a stable hip. Given the high complication rates with the modified done procedure, there seems to be less interest today than there was perhaps five or 10 years ago in regularly performing this operation. While the procedure is powerful and can result in a great outcome, many view the risk of a poor outcome not worth the risk. There is simply not a large percentage of the patients who uh, end up doing fair or good with all of them really falling into either an excellent or poor result, putting outcomes on a bimodal distribution. Anecdotally, the logistical challenges of having urgent OR access for what is often a five to six hour procedure, coupled with, lurgent, with limited surgeon availability, uh, are also substantial limitations to wider adoption of this technique. Moving on to our next case, this is another 11 year old female with five days of antecedent right hip pain when she tripped and fell, resulting in sudden inability to bear weight. In addressing management, this history describes an unstable left skiffy. Imaging suggests the slip angle is severe. This is an acute presentation given only five days of symptoms. Slip angle measures 76 degrees, consistent with one of the most severe slips. Posterior sloping angle on the contralateral side is elevated as well, suggesting high risk of uh, later slip on the other side. Modified oxygen score was 18, also in the high risk category for developing a contralateral slip. Again, we have four treatment options for our patient with an unstable acute slip. In this case, decision was made to perform an open reduction through an anterior approach and controlled reduction. A modified Smith-Peterson approach was performed. Capsulotomy was made with evacuation of hematoma. Guide pins were preloaded, but left short of the physis 
while a gentle reduction maneuver of the hip is performed. Tactile feedback is important while doing this gentle reduction to confirm no soft tissue interposition or damage to the retinaculum. The guide pins are then advanced beyond the physis. The orange arrow draws your attention to my index finger holding the reduction while an assistant passes the wires into the epiphysis. Two fully threaded cannulated screws are then used to stabilize the epiphysis, achieving an anatomic reduction. This technique was popularized by Klaus Parsch, who reported his results in 2009. His study is perhaps the most impressive to date on unstable skiffies, and the series produced one of the lowest rates of AVN with only 5%. Unique to his study was how he chose to define an unstable slip, however. Parsh utilized ultrasound in all hips with skiffy to detect an intraarticular effusion and determine stability rather than the loader definition that relies solely on their ability to bear weight. The presence of an effusion or hemarthrosis suggested instability and the possibility that the slip could then be reduced before pinning. Parsh concluded that open reduction and evacuation of hemarthrosis done as a semi-urgent procedure, which he defined within 24 hours, is a safe and reliable treatment for unstable slips. This cartoon shows the surgical protocol, and as he describes, the joggling maneuver, which now affectionately is referred to by many as the Parsh technique. Many attribute the reduction to forcibly reducing the metaphysis back. However, this technique actually calls for a lead better style reduction, using the fingertip only to monitor and gently guide reduction of the slip. Our patient maintained, uh, was maintained with limited weight bearing for eight weeks and progressed to slowly begin full weight bearing at three months postoperatively. Six months postoperatively, the physis is fused and radiographs confirm no signs of AVN. So we've now presented two unstable slips, two anatomic reductions, no cases of AVN. The law of averages tells you the next case may not be so lucky. Case seven is a 12 year old male with six weeks of antecedent hip pain who fell while dismounting from his mountain bike. He is unable to bear weight now. In addressing management, the patient presented with an acute on chronic slipped left, ca left capital femoral epiphysis. Based on the letter definition, this was an unstable slip as he was unable to bear weight. The slip angle was moderate to severe, right at 50 degrees. The patient is mildly obese with a BMI of 26 and the 98th percentile. He is at low risk of contralateral slip based on the modified Oxford score of 21. Again, we have four treatment options for a patient with an unstable acute on chronic slip. In this case, the decision was made to perform a closed reduction with screw fixation. A capsulotomy was also performed at the time of the closed reduction. Alignment was anatomic on postoperative x-rays. Unfortunately, at six weeks postoperatively, there are signs of bending of the superior screw, which is concerning for persistent instability. Decision was made to maintain limited weight bearing and reassess in another six weeks to better understand if this represents an early AVN or persistent slip. At three months postoperatively, there's obvious subchondral collapse with screw prominence, likely uh, just beginning to enter the joint. The physis has not closed, and some degree of residual slip is not clearly noted. There are limited options, but intervention at this point is critical to preserve the hip. Options to consider include revising fixation by upsizing to larger diameter and shorter length screws to stabilize the physis better. Another option would be to use a large bone plug in lieu of screws to expedite fusion across the physis, potentially considering a vascularized bone graft to support the subchondral bone, given signs of AVN and prevent further collapse. Final option would be to consider an early osteotomy, although given the limited physial closure, this would require combining with additional physial stabilization. After discussion with the family and our plastic surgery colleagues, we elected to treat the patient with a free vascularized fibula graft with a goal to both expedite physial fusion and prevent further collapse. Pre-vascularized fibular graft in avascular necrosis is not a new concept. It has been used in steroid-induced osteonecrosis with promising results. There's also data to suggest benefits in other conditions that can result in AVN, such as trauma and infection. The free vascularized fibular graft serves as a biologic support to a devascularized femoral head. One study on 52 patients with post skiffy avascular necrosis showed promising results with improvement in hip function and the vast majority maintaining their native hip at midterm follow up. Our patient underwent free vascularized fibular grafting at around four months following his index procedure. Immediate postoperative radiographs show fibular start graft to the left hip with a single screw to maintain graft fixation. At three months postoperatively, the patient was allowed to advance their weight bearing and the graft appears to be incorporating appropriately. At two years postoperatively, our patient has healed 
Bone graft is fully incorporated as designed, and there's been no further subchondral collapse. While there is significant residual deformity and the hip internal rotation is quite limited, the patient remains pain-free and is able to maintain an active lifestyle. The last three cases have shown three different approaches to an unstable skiffy. So which one is right? The reality is they are all right. And depending on the patient, the problem, and the provider, they were all appropriately managed. While it seems the pendulum has begun to swung away from the technically challenging modified done procedure over the last several years in favor of the PARSH technique, it is important to note that closed reduction has also gained more popularity, especially with the ability to measure epiphyseal perfusion and determine, determine if opening the hip is necessary before leaving the OR. A recent study showed routine use of intracranial pressure monitor um, to measure perfusion before leaving the operating room when treating an unstable skiffy may provide both prognostic information about perfusion and potentially prevent the sequelae of a vascular necrosis. This study out of the group in Atlanta utilized routine placement of an intracranial pressure monitor once the slip was stabilized. If there was not detectable perfusion, a capsulotomy was performed. In this case, they had return of perfusion in all six patients who initially were not perfused and no cases of AVN. This technique relies on a small pressure catheter, although in a pinch and arterial line could also be used, placed within a cannulated screw as seen within this image. If there is blood flow, the pressure catheter detects a waveform, which correlates with the patient's pulse oximeter, confirming epiphyseal perfusion. So you may be wondering, what do I do if there isn't any flow? And that's a great question. First, I start with a capsulotomy, using a cob elevator to enter the capsule. Generally, there's uh, a robust egress of fractured hematoma, especially in an unstable slip, uh, which was presumably causing a tamponade effect on epiphyseal perfusion. Perfusion can then be checked again to determine the adequacy of the capsulotomy. If flow does not return uh, with a percutaneous capsulotomy, I would then proceed with a more formal open capsulotomy to evacuate hematoma more thoroughly. If there's still no flow, I'd back up the screws and adjust my reduction so it was not as aggressive, taking tension off the retinacular vessels from any callus that may have formed posteriorly and was difficult to identify. If there is still no flow, this is when I would entertain pursuing a modified done procedure to remove any callus that may be putting the lateral pivoseal branches on tension and remove physeal cartilage in an attempt to get perfusion to return from the metaphysis as well. The last case I'll present today covers late presenting skiffy deformities, another controversial and challenging problem. This presentation is admittedly unusual. The patient presented with a healed skiffy deformity and had had intermittent hip symptoms for several years, most of which had subsided by the time they presented, suggestive of a chronic but now healed skiffy. There were substantial social challenges to getting care sooner, unfortunately. However, the patient does not have much hip pain currently, uh, although has quite limited activities. He is compensated very well given the severity of the deformity, and not surprisingly, he walks with a marked external foot progression angle, which was his biggest frustration. 3D imaging shows the severity of the slip and significant degree of remodeling that has taken place in this chronic skiffy with bridging callus both anteriorly and posteriorly. A chronic stable skiffy has a limited set of options at this age. The biggest challenge in this case is determining if the patient has fused enough physis to proceed with an osteotomy or whether they need to be pinned in situ and performing a delayed osteotomy. For mild skiffy deformities that present with femoroacetabular impingement symptoms only, arthroscopic osteoplasty is an excellent option. For bigger deformities, an osteotomy is almost always necessary to improve hip mechanics and gait. In this case, the biggest complaint from the patient was in regard to their gait and functional limitations due to such a severe external foot progression angle on the left side. Thus, we proceeded with primary osteotomy. There are three main osteotomies performed for late presenting skiffy deformities, and all are at the intertrochanteric level due to their lower risk of AVN. The most straightforward option is to correct the rotational deformity by internally rotating the femur to correct the severe external foot progression angle. A derotational osteotomy may be combined with an osteoplasty to improve hip flexion as well. When hip flexion is severely limited, a biplanar osteotomy, uh, which includes internal rotation and flexion, is often indicated. This osteotomy corrects the extension deformity and allows for more hip flexion before obligate external rotation occurs, making it easier to sit or ride a bike, for example. A final option is the combination of flexion and valgus. If there is limited hip abduction or segmental AVN, this may be the best option to offload a portion of the femoral head uh, to make the joint more congruent or to improve 
abduction. The Imhauser osteotomy combines flexion and internal rotation to correct the residual deformity with an anterior closing wedge. The Southwick osteotomy, on the other hand, which has similar goals, is a pure valgus and flexion osteotomy, increasing abduction and hip flexion to improve hip range of motion and gait mechanics. Both of these osteotomies can, however, create a substantial secondary deformity and make hip arthroplasty a little bit more challenging. Like many conditions, long-term follow-up remains the holy grail. However, literature points to encouraging results with these procedures. A series out of Germany showed that for patients treated with the Imhauser osteotomy, which is flexion and internal rotation, nearly 80% had a good or excellent result based on the Southwood classification at long-term follow-up. The authors concluded that the Imhauser osteotomy remains a worthwhile operation for the correction of a severe skiffy deformity. In this case, the patient underwent flexion and derotation osteotomy fixed with a blade plate. Following osteotomy, they had improved gait mechanics and sitting tolerance, but there are certainly degenerative changes and joint space narrowing that are still present, so it is difficult to know how long this hip can be preserved. At the beginning of the talk, Dr. Nielsen introduced four controversies in the management of slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Together, we reviewed eight cases, ranging from bread and butter, stable skiffy, decision-making with regards to whether to treat the contralateral hip prophylactically, and the challenges associated with younger patients that develop skiffy. We discussed treatment options for unstable slips and new options for monitoring perfusion intraoperatively, hopefully to potentially decrease the rate of ABN associated with this condition. Finally, we reviewed some options for managing chronic skiffy deformities to improve hip motion and gait mechanics. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Dr. Nielsen and I would like to take any questions now. I would encourage people to just speak up if you have a question um, or you can place something in the chat box and I'll read, read your question. You guys did such a great job covering it. Um, there really may not be many questions. I, I had two that probably reflect my um, lack of knowledge about the topic. One was, uh, I think, a simple one. Um, what percentage of these kids present with knee pain instead of hip pain? And, and how careful do you have to be to make sure you don't miss the diagnosis given uh, the disastrous um, consequences that you've shown us for some of these kids? That's a great question. I don't know the actual percentage of patients presenting with knee pain, but there have been several studies demonstrating like a significantly delayed diagnosis in patients presenting with knee pain versus hip pain, especially if they present to their pediatrician. Um, so in general, in the, when, at least when I was seeing patients in the ED, if they presented with knee pain um, without a history of trauma, I would get hip radiographs and knee radiographs just so you don't miss the skiffy because it is such a devastating complication. Yeah, I'll echo that. Um, recent data suggests about 25% probably uh, their initial presentation is knee pain. And we certainly have had our large share of patients that have had knee x-rays, um, knee MRIs even, uh, but no pelvis films. And so it is important uh, to recognize how common it is to present with knee pain uh, in the setting of a skiffy, especially in that age group. And especially if body habit is reflects um, higher risk for skiffy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roberts um, has his hands uh, hand raised. Um, Jesse, you have a yeah. question? Um, I, I, you're mentioning sort of increasing use of the ICP monitor um, and you know measuring perfusion to help direct what level of therapy you do. Um, and I may have missed an actual number, but do we have good data on how predictive that is? Because I can certainly think of cases, including you know our modified done, where the the ICP monitor would suggest there's no perfusion is not 100% predictive of ABN. To be fair, that patient's not entirely out of the woods yet, but um, I'm just wondering if we're using that to truly direct therapy, do we know how predictive it is? And what do you do with a negative result that does well in the end? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So the data that was published by the group out of Atlanta actually you know, they made it obviously seem like, you know, if there's perfusion, the, you know, sort of one of those things where it's very sensitive. If you detect perfusion, that's a very, very good sign that there's likely uh, to be no uh, untowards outcome in terms of development of ABN. Um, interestingly, they had three patients that they excluded, and that's because they said there was uh, malfunction of the 
ICP probe. So I, I would interpret that to mean that they detected no perfusion, but yet the patient didn't develop AVN, although I certainly don't have any proof that that's what happened. But they basically said that there was malfunction of the ICP probe in three patients, so they excluded them in their consecutive series. Um, so there are certainly um, challenges associated with use of that. Number one being that we don't use it very often. And so um, finding it, uh, finding the sterile component of it, having it available and, and having, you know, a team that is not sterile available to help set up that equipment is, is part of the challenge as, as you've seen and as I've seen as well. So it's one of those things where the more often you use it, the more comfortable people get with it. And then of course, as a result, the easier it is to use and use properly in the future. So I think with increased use and, and trying to sort of force it as in use it more often and get people comfortable with it, we might see um, more reliable results. Hey, Todd. First, uh, Ina and Todd, that was an excellent, both excellent presentations. I've always had a question about this condition and its treatment because some of the treatments are time limited, right? You can't wait forever on them. So is it equitable to have one surgeon who performs some of these procedures that are time limited um, for the patients who might have their slips when that one surgeon is out of town. I, I just, how, how do you deal with that when there's only one surgeon who can do some of these procedures? Yeah, that's the question. Dr. Nielsen, you want <laughs> to so, There was that one, one study we presented where they had their um, treatment algorithm for patients with unstable, severe slips or poor perfusion. And they suggested that if um, there was no one available that was comfortable with these more advanced procedures to do an inside to fixation and then have the person who was comfortable with it do it the next day or in the morning um, or even transfer to a center where somebody was comfortable doing that procedure after the hip had been initially stabilized. So I don't know if somebody's gone for a week, how that works, but at least in a more uh, slightly delayed setting, it can be feasible. Yeah, there's interestingly some data that I don't know if it's been formally published, but it's been uh, at least presented from Israel where they would do this, where they would basically pin in situ and then take patients back as a scheduled procedure within a week to do a modified done realignment. And they had pretty positive results from that in that they um, did not have a very high rate of AVN relative to what's published, at least in the North American literature. And so that has started to become a little bit more of a feasible approach is to, you know, certainly insight to stabilize these hips. Uh, so that way there's not further risk um, or at least further risk to the vascular supply uh, and then perform a realignment when there is somebody who's comfortable with the procedure later on. But in terms of the, the equity question that comes up um, with every procedure, I mean, if someone who has um, you know, a substantial trauma, um, there is not necessarily based on where they live and based on resources available in that location, always somebody available to provide the most up-to-date, um, you know, techniques that are out there. There's a question from Dr. Manor, and he's asking if there um, is variation in incident, incidence of skiffies across different countries and different regions, and then um, within the groups at higher risk, males, Blacks, Hispanics, is it an issue of obesity and endocrine issues or are there other unknown factors that may be at play? So in terms of the groups at higher risk, there was a lot of literature indicating that these um, like Polynesian populations, uh, black populations, Hispanic populations were at higher risk. But when a lot of the newer studies control for factors such as obesity and socioeconomic status, those differences kind of fall away and it be, um, is more an issue having to do with obesity or endocrine issues. There is some variation seasonally. Um, Skiffy occurs at higher rates when there's less sunlight. So up here, um, kind of in the winter, there's a little bit of an increased incidence. And in the Southern hemisphere, it occurs obviously during their winter. Um, and I know some countries have a higher incidence of so-called skinny Skiffy. So a little bit more endocrine issues versus obesity, such as I think uh, in Switzerland, they have a little bit of a higher incidence of, of skinny patients having this disorder. <laughs> Any, any other questions? I think Dr. Hey, and Todd, I have a question. With, with how bad this can be, um, is there any role for asymptomatic screening? So like, for example, um, sports physicals and teenagers will evaluate for hokum or screening colonoscopy or breast examination. Is there any role for 
screening asymptomatic kids are high risk for this? Uh, that's a great question. There's not really a lot um, that's been reported on asymptomatic screening. And I think that you would certainly have a obvious target population, which would be those that have elevated BMIs that you could start with. Um, of course, then you run into the challenges of the cost of that screening and the radiation exposure to the pelvis, which is um, not exactly risk-free, although certainly the amount of radiation from a digital x-ray, uh, which you could just get a one view, you know, bilateral frog uh, hip view, uh, which would be relatively low dose to give you some insight. Um, so there is nothing that's been published out there on it, primarily because um, I think in this country, we have such a hard time screening, even for conditions like uh, developmental hip dysplasia in infants that have high risk factors. So I can imagine that there would be challenges associated with doing it um, in our fragmented healthcare system, but that certainly would um, potentially prevent the development of some uh, at least severe chronic deformities. In terms of the acute, I'm not sure it would change much, and the acutes uh, do tend to be more unstable slips, uh, which do have the higher rate of AVN. So I'm not sure we would be as um, lucky in detecting the ones that have more problems. Thank you. It's uh, 7.46, and I want to thank Drs. Nielsen and Bunberg for that great presentation. And um, thank you to Todd for um, taking the pediatric and adolescent hip on. He um, spent an extra six months training at Boston Children's to bring uh, this expertise um, to Seattle Children's and to the department. And uh, just an update on Grand Rounds, we're starting to discuss um, which of our meetings should start to be back in person again. I'm soliciting input from different um, faculty and faculty leadership. Um, we are planning on having a couple of visiting professors over the next year, and um, we will uh, for sure open those up to um, um, an in-person Grand Rounds presentation and almost certainly keep um, the Zoom as an option um, for people who are absolutely unable to make it in person. Um, and with that, I wish everybody a, a good week and um, get online if you're interested in uh, getting your next uh, COVID booster. Thank you. Recording stopped.